What if aging is a disease and that disease is treatable? This is the quote at the back of David Sinclair's book, Lifespan. We are living in an era of the worried well, where in pursuit of trying to improve our health and longevity, we may in fact actually be harming it. To say that aging is a disease is to pathologize life itself. If you're new around here, my name is Adam MacDonald. I am a performance nutritionist with an MSc, a natural competitive bodybuilder, and a health and fitness coach for high performing men. In this channel, we try and take complex scientific health and fitness topics Topics and translate them into practical application. Preoccupation with health and lifespan optimization is becoming more and more popular amongst the general population. Now you might see this as just a simple pursuit of trying to improve your health and fitness as you age, but these fringe ideas that are gaining tons of popularity are often just mechanistic speculation and a manifestation of something called immortality projects. These are projects that the author of the book, The Denial of Death, Ernest Becker, says are ways to give people meaning in their lives. And they're often to deal with death anxiety or in other words, a fear of dying. Take for example, Brian Johnson, the former CEO who sold his company for 800 million, now spends $2 million a year on his health and his body in order to slow down and completely stop aging. I think I'm potentially the most measured human in all of history. And while it makes some really good points about looking after yourself, the idea that you need 30 clinicians, researchers, and doctors to optimize your health is just completely absurd. It's not fun to be diseased and aged and feel bad. That's not the games we want to be playing. We really want to be doing other stuff with our time. And it appears recently that he's even started to inject his own son's blood. And while you may think it's his own body, he's got a lot of money, what harm could it be doing? It actually could be doing a lot. 42% of American adults are obese. Now, when we extend that number to people who are overweight, that number nearly doubles. And only one in every 10 Americans eats enough fruits and vegetables per day. So it's pretty clear that we find it hard to even get the basics right. Now, this may not be the demographic who follow the biohacking community or the longevity YouTube videos. And most likely, if you're watching this, you're probably more likely to fall into the camp of people who actually do eat enough fruits and vegetables. Now, this may not be the demographic of people who are actually trying to increase their lifespan because people who tend to focus on their health typically have better health already. But it's pretty clear from research that perceived psychological stress increases your overall mortality rate. In other words, your risk of dying increases if you have higher levels of perceived stress. If perceived stress was something that you actively did, like smoking or drinking, this is something that Brian Johnson himself would call self-destructive behavior. There's evidence to show that simply tracking calories can cause stress within individuals. One paper stating monitoring via the use of food diaries likely increased perceived stress by creating repeated stressors throughout the day. And a 2017 paper from the Journal of Clinical Sleep Medicine coined a term called orthoinsomnia. This is essentially where people who are trying to get a perfect sleep score with their tracking device ended up getting less sleep because they got sleep anxiety and the pursuit of trying to get that score made their sleep actually worse. And in fact, in medicine, there's a phenomenon known as overdiagnosis. This is where a patient is overly monitored and the doctor will intervene for a benign problem, but the intervention will actually end up causing more problems than the benign problem would have originally caused. Tracking 50 variables like a walking intensive care unit in a bid to live longer will backfire for most people. While it might be an interesting hypothesis, health span and lifespan research is measured using longitudinal data, meaning we look at people's lifestyles across their lifetime and make correlations from that data. It's not just about picking specific biomarkers and then trying to optimize for them. In a 1975 article on British monetary policy, Goddard's law stated that when a measure becomes a target, it is no longer a good measure. And this is essentially what happens when we're trying to target specific biomarkers in order to get them to a certain score. Take for example, resting heart rate. A low resting heart rate is associated with high levels of fitness. But if you go to the doctor and get some beta blockers, you'll also have a low resting heart rate, but your fitness isn't necessarily improved. These biomarkers and numbers are downstream effects from upstream lifestyle choices. And we can often get the desire to hack the system by taking certain supplements or drugs in order to get a better score. But in order to maximize your health and lifespan, you don't need to know the exact C-reactive protein scores on a daily basis, nor do you need to know the fluctuations in your cholesterol on a daily basis. So what is the 80-20 or Pareto's principle of maximizing your health and your lifespan? First of all, we shouldn't be trying to pathologize aging. Aging is a completely normal part of life. It is inevitable and in pursuit of trying not to age, we end up not really living at all. Instead, we should be trying to age successfully. So what does successful aging really mean? Well, we don't want to just increase the time between our birth and our death, but also the amount of time during that period where we're actually healthy and functioning. So according to a 2018 paper by Lee and colleagues, here are the top five ways that we can live longer. In other words, it's a starter pack for living longer. Number one, never smoke. That's pretty obvious. Two, maintain a BMI or body mass index between 18 and 24.99. Number three, get at least 30 minutes of vigorous or moderate activity per day. 
Number four, no more than one to three units of alcohol per day, or in other words, no more than one to two bottles of beer per day. And number five, maintain a high score on the Alternative Healthy Eating Index. Now we can dive a little bit deeper into this and put different pieces of research together to make a bit of a clearer picture. Obviously, we know why smoking isn't a good idea, so there's no point in even talking about that. The same probably goes for excessive alcohol consumption as well. When it comes to body fat, contrary to what many fitness professionals will tell you, you don't need to get your body fat actually that low in order to maximize health benefits. For men, a fat mass in index below six doesn't really seem to have any more additional benefits. That's about 20% body fat. And in fact, when we get below 12% body fat, we start to see negative health consequences. Now, this may be contradictory to what some longevity YouTubers might say, like Brian Johnson, who's very, very lean. However, he's gaming the system by taking exogenous steroids while his body fat is so low. The amount of muscle mass that you have is important. We see benefits of having more muscle up until around a fat-free mass index 20 when it starts to flatline after that. For reference sake, my fat-free mass index is about 23. So, I don't really need to gain any more muscle if my goal is optimal health and longevity. With resistance training in the gym, it seems that 60 to 100 minutes actually maximizes the health benefits. For a lot of people who go to the gym, this might seem like only a very small amount, and there may actually be downsides to doing much more than this in the gym, but this is still an area of contention and there's no real conclusive evidence yet that we can do too much resistance exercise. With cardiovascular training, it seems to be pretty clear. There seems to be a dose response relationship between the amount of activity you do and all cause mortality risk. Beyond that, we just don't have any more research. But in my opinion, you're probably going to get the best benefits from going from a low amount of activity to slightly higher. When it comes to the type of cardio, whether it's low intensity or high intensity, it is pretty difficult to say which is going to be best. It's just a study design that would be just completely unfeasible. Somebody just does low intensity cardio for the whole life and someone just does high intensity cardio and we see which one lives longer and lives healthier. But we do know that a higher VO2 max, which essentially is just a measure of how much oxygen your muscles are using while you're exercising, is associated with greater longevity. So essentially just try and get as fit as you possibly can and that can be done through moderate intensity low intensity or high intensity or even a mix of all the cardio together now diet is usually pretty tricky because people tend to want you to tell them specific foods to eat or specific foods not to eat but the alternate healthy eating index which is used in longevity research states that we should eat five servings of vegetables per day four servings of fruits per day nuts legumes healthy fats and fish where possible and of course all while staying at a healthy body weight and body fat essentially the alternate healthy eating index looks at your overall diet and gives you a score so the higher that score is the better but there are no magic foods in that scoring system when it comes to health and longevity people often just look at physical biomarkers of health things like your blood pressure or your LDL cholesterol levels but what they often forget to look at is your emotional and mental health which are extremely important for longevity and it's really difficult to give specific things to do in these areas because there's no biomarkers per se that you can track what we do know is getting 7 to 8.5 hours of undisrupted sleep per night is linked with longer health healthy and chronic disease-free lifespan. A 2020 meta-analysis also found that combining cognitively challenging tasks alongside exercise was beneficial more so than exercise by itself for long-term cognitive health. This included things like playing the Nintendo Wii or learning a new skill. And in a cohort of over 7,000 adults, researchers found that purpose in life was associated with greater lifespan. Now, the questions in this research was very subjective, but having something like a philanthropic endeavor, a career, or a hobby that you really enjoy is probably going to be really important outside of your physical biomarkers. And finally, it's really clear that loneliness is associated with increased mortality risk. According to research, men evaluate loneliness as the connection with their partner, whereas females evaluate loneliness as the connection with their network. Being lonely increases inflammation and it's also associated with higher levels of drinking and tobacco use. As the longevity research expert Charles M. Brenner states, the most important things that people could do to age better is to maintain high physical and mental activity. So instead of trying to hyper fixate on the inevitable, double down on the basics that really work. Now this doesn't mean that you necessarily do less. It means that you put more of your effort into the things that research actually shows that increase your health span and your lifespan. Sometimes we can be led astray by catchy terms and scientific claims. And if you like this video, you'll probably like this video that I made on Athletic Greens. So don't forget to like and subscribe and ask any questions that you have down in the comments.